Also ahead, a man killed in a shark attack off the Gold Coast near the Queensland border. Victoria looks to New South Wales to improve its contact tracing system. And an inclusive playground designed by young adults with a disability. Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Lorna Dunkley. Two Australian journalists, including the ABC's China correspondent Bill Bertels, have been rushed out of China amid fears they faced arbitrary detention. They were safely bundled out of the country after a week-long diplomatic standoff. Here's foreign affairs reporter Stephen Jedgetts. After almost five decades, the ABC checks out of China. Bill Bertel's lonely departure ending a tense seven-day ordeal. The ABC's China correspondent for five years, Bertel's is now back in Australia. It's a relief to be back in a country with genuine rule of law. His posting time cut short by a late-night visit from Chinese officials. Midnight on Wednesday, uh, the knock at the door came and there were six state security police plus a translator. Last week, Australia's embassy warned him to get out of China, but before he could get on a plane, police barred him from leaving. That's when this, this, this standoff, this diplomatic game of chess really commenced. Good morning from Shanghai. There's... And there were two pawns. The Australian Financial Review's China correspondent, Michael Smith, was also banned from leaving. Both men ended up taking refuge on Australian diplomatic compounds, Bertels in Beijing and Smith in Shanghai, while Australian and Chinese officials wrangled over their future. Our embassy has, uh, I think, worked very hard, very diligently in the past few days. Chinese police said they wanted to discuss Chung Lei, an Australian journalist working for Chinese state media who disappeared into detention last month. The whole episode was about harassment. Diplomats struck a deal. Both journalists would be able to leave China if they agreed to a token interview. It felt very political and I very much felt like a... Uh, a diplomatic tussle. Whatever the motive, the relief is obvious. It's so good to be home, so happy. I can't say any more at the moment. And the consequences clear. For the first time in decades, no major Australian media outlet has a journalist left in China. Trust between Australia and China is now at bedrock levels, and that mutual suspicion isn't limited to officials and politicians. China craves understanding for its political system and for its achievements, but gaining that appreciation just became much harder for Australians. Still, the ABC hasn't given up on China. We'll get straight back on the front foot and be seeking to put correspondents uh, back there. And neither has Bill Bertels. Hopefully the winds of change might blow in one way or another and the window to get back there in future at some point reopens. But for now, the door is slammed shut. Stephen Jedgett's ABC News, Canberra. China has always resisted Western ideas about media freedom, but has mostly allowed foreign media to chart its astonishing rise from a poor developing nation to a formidable global power. Until today, the ABC had been a constant witness. But there's no indication if, or indeed when, it'll ever be allowed back. Here's National Affairs correspondent Greg Jennett. When the bamboo curtain lifted for a glimpse, Australians were among the first to slip behind it. There's no need for very long discussions. So began a long, long era of listening, watching and reporting on China. The city, with its 7 million inhabitants, runs on bicycles. In 1973, Paul Raphael became the ABC's first Peking-based correspondent. They appeared well-fed and cheerful. Dozens would follow as reporters, camera operators and producers. Through 47 turbulent years, the communist regime's tolerated, even if not enjoyed, the telling of its stories to the world. Tens of thousands of people continue to march through the streets of Beijing. The Chinese authorities had had enough. The regime's tension with Western media has been a constant, especially with its tendency to expose human rights abuses. But the flight of reporters Bertels and Smith marks a turning point and a breaking point. We have to realise that we're dealing with a sort of a renegade authoritarian state that will do anything to cement the power of Xi Jinping. 
By expulsion, visa cancellation or volition, the ranks of foreign media have been shrinking for months. Arbitrary detention is a risk these days highlighted in Australia's official travel advice. Bill Bertels and his fellow traveller may have avoided it, in no small part because of the intervention by the ambassador to Beijing and his team. It is alarming when you see exit bans placed on Australian journalists. It is disappointing that after many years, Australia will not have a media organisation present in China. We always welcome foreign journalists. China protects the legitimate rights of the journalists. The relationship's a mess, never worse in 30 years. But Maurice Payne's ruled out tit-for-tat expulsions of Chinese reporters here, focused on diplomacy salvaging whatever's left intact. This is not so much about Australia as it is about control. With every escalation, China's signalling its determination to project its image and its message on its own terms. There's something to be gained in that for Beijing and something to be lost too. Come on, this is China. Including the good stuff, like China's sufferings and setbacks. The whole place has been destroyed. It's near miraculous economic transformation its culture and traditions. These performances are so important. Over, spectacularly, in a blackout of unknown duration. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Canberra. And later this hour, we'll be he hearing from a freelance journalist in Hong Kong on that story. The numbers are staying down in Victoria, but unfortunately, so is the testing rate. Eight Victorian COVID patients died overnight and there have been 55 new cases. That's a slight increase from yesterday, but the Premier's described the trend as promising. And he's announced the creation of new localised tracing teams to help identify and contain any flare-ups. Richard Willingham reports. This clinic in Altona North was one of several in Melbourne's west that saw a spike in COVID cases last week. Frustrated by the state's contact tracing response, local doctors took control. The contact tracing until recently has been woeful um, and I don't blame the people doing it because they're fabulous people doing a fabulous job. It's just that the numbers were massive and the whole public health response in Victoria had been dumbed down. Doctors like former AMA President Mukesh Hakawal reached out to the Health Department and local council to help manage positive cases. The group also connecting with non-English speaking communities in the area. We know the people who are infected, we know the, their connections, we know the community and we know how we can make this happen. Victoria's contact tracing system has been plagued by massive delays in reaching close contacts. Contact tracing is, was a disaster for me as a GP. I remember I gave two contradicted advice to the patient, a student from Attaqua. Friday I told them, are you negative? You can do whatever you want because you don't have symptoms. And Monday I contacted them and said, please, no, no, you can't because you were in contact with a positive case. Now the state is setting up suburban response units across Melbourne. When you get to a stage where numbers are very low and you want to keep them low and the strategy is depending on you keeping them low, then you can devolve out and you can have that really quick localised response. Officials from Melbourne are also being sent to Sydney to learn from their New South Wales counterparts. Contact tracing is the only way we can safely reopen this state and Daniel Andrews has stuffed it as badly as he stuffed hotel quarantine. Education about COVID-19 within local communities is a major issue. Local doctors say too many people are underplaying the significance of coronavirus, while others are refusing to get a test over fears of the social consequences of a positive diagnosis. We have to put the, the issue of COVID as a community issue, not individual issue. It's not your problem, it's your problem as a part of our community. There were 55 new cases today, taking the all-important two-week average to 78.6. But there were fewer than 9,000 tests, the lowest number in months. It's really important. We need to test, get a test. We can come out of this lockdown earlier. And the Premier has confirmed restrictions could be eased sooner if case numbers drop faster than anticipated. Richard Willingham, ABC News, Melbourne. 
The hotel quarantine inquiry in Melbourne has been told police raised concerns with private security contractors two weeks into the bungled program. A meeting was arranged after guests were photographed leaving the hotel for exercise and trying to enter a nearby cafe and convenience store. In April, police were told guests at the Pan Pacific Hotel were being allowed out for walks. Officers met with security firms shortly afterwards, but it was decided police were not needed on site 24 hours a day. The New South Wales Health Minister has given assurances that two Sydney emergency departments won't be affected by more than 100 health workers going into isolation. The move has been prompted by more staff connected to Concord and Liverpool hospitals becoming infected with coronavirus. Ashley Raper reports. For a Premier in a pandemic, this is as close as it gets to business as usual. On the south coast, announcing a new hospital for Shell Harbour. And this is really about saying to the community, not only are we going to provide you with world-class health services, but in the process there will be 2,800 jobs created from building this hospital. While attention is paid there, the Health Minister is trying to play down concern about an outbreak of COVID at two Sydney hospitals. The fact that uh, we've had a, a very small number of health staff who have uh, also fallen uh, victim to COVID is not unexpected. Two more health workers from Concord Hospital's emergency department have tested positive. So there's now seven cases connected to the cluster from Concord and Liverpool hospitals. 100 workers across both hospitals are also in isolation. Concord Hospital has been forced to cancel all elective surgery this week and will close to visitors. But the health minister maintains staff will be backfilled. The New South Wales health system is the 10th biggest business in the country. There's 140,000 staff. Yes, we certainly do have enough staff. Health has also issued an alert ordering people to isolate immediately if they ate in the bistro at Oatlands Golf Club on Friday night, went to Plus Fitness in Epping on Saturday morning or at Paperboy Cafe in Concord on Sunday morning. Overall, there have been nine new cases recorded in New South Wales. The source of one infection is unknown, while there are two more cases connected to the CBD cluster. That includes another student at King Koppel Rose Bay. She's a boarder, so now boarding students in years 7 to 10 have been sent home to isolate. There is good news, though, for New South Wales students boarding in Queensland. They can come home for the holidays and will be exempt from quarantining when they return north for Term 4. Ashley Raper, ABC News. A few more details on that that uh, Ashley was talking about there. And Queensland Health has agreed to more exemptions for interstate boarding school students uh, who want to return home for the upcoming holidays. These are the details. Students will no longer have to quarantine upon their return to Queensland if they are from an area of New South Wales or the ACT with no active COVID-19 cases. And it also stipulates that whilst they're at home, they can't leave their primary residence or have visitors and they must return to Queensland by road. Parents and guardians will also be able to take or collect their children from the school. Meantime, Queensland has recorded one new case of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours. The woman in her 20s is a returned traveller in hotel quarantine on the Sunshine Coast. The COVID crisis has hit aged care hardest, but it's also exposed confusion at the borders for those wanting to work in the sector. The inconsistencies in who and who cannot re-enter Australia for work is prompting bigger questions about workforce shortages. Political reporter Matthew Doran has more from Canberra. Kathmandu is half a world away from Tasmania, but while Spana Nakami hasn't been able to travel, her thoughts are often back in Hobart from where her colleagues at an aged care centre provide updates on some of her favourite residents. They still remember me, who I am and what kind of person I was. After four years working in Hobart, the highly qualified carer and nursing assistant made a quick dash home to care for her sick mother. But it coincided with Australia locking down its borders to lock out the worst of coronavirus. I was just here for like three weeks. I just got stuck here. Foreigners wanting to enter Australia must have the skills deemed to be in the national interest and only if they have a letter from an employer vouching for them. Only registered nurses working in aged care qualify for a travel exemption according to one government list, but other aged care workers aren't included. Another list, which defines critical skills, is more vague, 
People working in medical technology, agriculture and engineering can apply. Aged care was quietly added when the ABC started asking questions. It just beggars belief that when you have a sector in such crisis and a workforce in such crisis, that the government's not doing everything it can. After nine rejections, Spana's 10th application was accepted. The timing, again, when the ABC started investigating her case. I was very happy and relieved when I saw the email. Border Force says more than 5,000 exemptions have been granted since Australia's borders closed. But it won't...